to Six Strings and Things, a guitar adventure. The place for all things guitar and gear. Here are your hosts, Chris, Jesse, and Robert. All right, thank you, Scott Fletcher. Welcome to Six Strings and Things, a guitar adventure, your fortnightly webcast for all things guitar and gear. I'm Chris. With me tonight is Jesse. Hello. And not with us tonight, as usual, is Robert. Robert. <laughs> Poor Robert. The man works too hard. We love Robert. Yeah. He'll be back on the show someday. Um, you know what I'm going to do? We're going we're gonna to put a, a, a Michelangelo-esque... You know how they have a Photoshop things where you can turn a picture into a painting-looking thing? I'm going to oh, yes. do one of Robert's so we can put oh, that in his square. We should do that, yes. <laughs> He will hate us. <laughs> <laughs> then, then he can come for the show. <laughs> that's right. That's right. I'm All sorry. Right, Go well, on, Chris. No, that's okay. So what have you been doing this week guitar-wise, Jesse? I've been uh, playing around just some uh, basic blues stuff. Um, doing a little bit of uh, – a little more on jazz chords, just trying to keep the stuff under my fingers and uh, breaking strings. <laughs> in fact i broke I broke a string right before i have to use a different guitar tonight because i broke a string right before the show so uh i've only ever broken one string and it was uh, not even my fault uh my previous instructor um was tightening the um high e string the first string mm-hmm. and over tightened it in um while i was playing and snap it snapped it's the only time i've broken a string and i, and I, I guess i need to start playing harder or something i don't know the secret of breaking strings is to own guitars that have Floyd Rose uh, vibratos on them. Oh, then, yeah. then you'll break plenty of strings. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And put eights on them. <laughs> and put eights on them, right. Yes. <laughs> so uh, this week I have been doing uh, arpeggios, arpeggios, arpeggios. I've been arpeggiating, I guess is the verb. Yes. Wonderful. Uh, I've been working on the um, E shape arpeggio and the A sharp, yeah, A shape arpeggio. Uh, pretty much working on the E shape from the sixth string, working my way up uh, to the first string, and then on the E shape, just starting, or excuse me, the A shape, and just starting on the fifth string and uh, as the root, and working my way up to the, the first string. And uh, at some point, uh, I want to get to a place where when I'm playing over or backing track or with you or whatever, and you know, you know, you hit that G chord, I'm playing something that sounds like it goes with a G chord as opposed to. <laughs> Something in G minor pentatonic, which could be anywhere. <laughs> yeah. But getting to a point where one um, is playing with the other person. So, you know, like whatever chord they're playing. So playing the proper notes to go along with that chord and playing something that sounds somewhat decent and playing something while paying attention to what the other person is doing is very difficult. Yeah. You know, I'm finding true. it very hard because, you know, you got to be able to hear, oh, look, he's missed. He moved to a C chord. Now I can play these notes. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I oh, I'm struggling with that. And I think, you know, as I do it more, hear it more, it will become sort of burned into my head and I'll be able to recognize chords better. And I won't have to sort of worry too much about, you know, where are we in the progression or, or you know, that kind of thing. I can just hear it. And go, oh, OK, yeah, we're playing C and, you know, just go along. But I'm a long way off from that. That's true. What's cool, too, about arpeggios is really, I mean, they're chord shapes to a degree. Mm-hmm. And so like what you were talking about last time where you were working on chords all over the neck, um, right. you kind of do arpeggios all over the neck uh, by the same, kind of by definition, you know? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I have a, a, a sheet that I have um, looked up online and I found uh, the arpeggios up and down the neck and the different shapes Mm -hmm. shape arpeggios and i can see that there's a connection there and so i can imagine going up and down the neck with the arpeggios i'm doing dominant seventh arpeggios i guess i should point out Mm -hmm. um so that our our good listeners at home can uh, know which one i'm talking about um for those of you that aren't aware of arpeggios they are basically the notes in a chord and so you play them you know you play those notes while the rhythm player is playing a particular chord and it sounds like, hey, you know what, we're playing with this person as opposed to just blasting, you know, minor pentatonic over top of some chord progression and say G, for example, mm-hmm. which, you know, I can do that. Uh, but now I need to play like a grown up a little bit more and sound like 
<laughs> sound like I'm playing along with people as opposed to I'm doing my thing and you know the other person's doing their thing and that's it. Mm-hmm. So and arpeggios, I think, is one way of getting you there. Um, Definitely to understand that. So. All right. Well, let's go ahead and move on to our uh, this fortnight in guitar history, and we found a few rock and roll birthdays this week. Yeah. So. Um... Uh, okay, so we have uh, 1953. We probably shouldn't give the dates because these guys, maybe they're a little bit uh, skittish about their age, but that tough. It's on the internet. That's right. <laughs> on the internet. Uh, Tommy Shaw from Styx and Damn Yankees um, was born uh, September 11th. So uh, I used to love his playing and his singing too, of course, with Styx. I was a big yeah. Styx fan back in the day. That really dates me. <laughs> <I know>. <laughs> <laughs> but boy, talk about arena rock, you know? I mean, those guys yeah, are awesome. Oh, yeah. Um, we also have uh, Joe Perry, um, 1950, uh, September 10th. Uh, he, of course, is guitar player for Aerosmith, um, who are still out there rocking. Oh, yeah. They're, they're like, well, not as old as the Stones, but the same kind of thing. They've just been around forever. It's amazing when a band can do that. Yeah. Because, you know, you see hundreds, thousands of bands, right? Mm-hmm. Just, you know, one hit, couple hits. Maybe they get to that sophomore album. But these bands that are sticking around, you know, 30, 40, 50 years in some cases, you know, yeah. still putting out good quality music. It's amazing. And I know, I, for what I, I shouldn't say I know, from what I understand, Aerosmith has broken up before and gotten back together and that kind of thing. At least from what I understand, uh, I could be wrong about that. Um, but just imagine, I mean, just working with the same people for that long. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's why they break up and get back together. Yeah, well, sure. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, yeah, no doubt. I mean, it's tough to uh, it's tough to do that, um, and and function well together and and all that. It's pretty amazing. Aerosmith has a, a special place for me. Um, it was uh, my wife's first Christmas present to me was tickets to see Aerosmith down in D.C. Oh, wow. And so, yeah, it was kind of that awkward first Christmas. You know, we've been dating for like a month. It's like, what do you get? the other person i think i got her like a teddy bear and some stuff (laughs) and you know and i unwrap her present it's like you know two tickets to go see aerosmith and with the assumption of course that i was taking her uh so i did Mm -hmm. (laughs) of course (laughs) right so yeah yeah and here's one i i missed this one september 7th buddy holly 1936 oh cool there you go yeah an early uh, stratocaster fan there yeah, and he probably wouldn't care so much that you said his birthday. So I don't think so. No. Yeah, no, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what we have for the uh, guitar history yep. for tonight. Yes, and if you know of a particularly interesting moment in guitar history, please send it our way. The comments on YouTube. You can tweet us at SST Show. Uh, but please let us know. We'll be happy to share your favorite moment in guitar, or actually your favorite Fortnite even in guitar history. Absolutely. So. All right, let's go on to our next segment. Uh, Jesse decided he wanted to really point it out that uh, Chris is now a solid intermediate player. So, <laughs> <laughs> so before we get to our main topic tonight, Jesse was just burning to like talk about that tonight for uh, for a bit of time. And there's some backstory here for the listeners. Uh, I guess it was two episodes ago. Um, we just had a ma- massive failure during recording, and so we had to completely re-record the show. But during the first attempt. Uh, I had made a comment that my instructor that night had said, oh, you know, you're solid in the intermediate player range now. And so we went off on this tangent of like, you know, what happens when you become an intermediate? Is it like, you know, the martial arts where you get a belt and you get a little stripe on your belt or do you get like a I think I think Jesse had brought the iron on patch, which I think would be awesome. Oh, yes. Uh, you have to have an iron on patch, yeah. a solid intermediate. And it was <laughs> it brought back memories of like when we were taking swimming lessons as a kid, you know, and you every little step you'd get a patch, you know, that you could put on your I guess your bathing suits, although I don't know if you could iron that off. <laughs> Where do you put a patch when you're swimming? Especially as a male. I mean it's just trunks. It's not like <laughs> Especially if you collect a half a dozen of these things. Right. I think stickers, though, I think that's pretty good. You know, like uh, time yeah. in a little sticker for each guitar. That's like, you know, a year that you've been playing. Yeah. Or uh, the football players, especially the college football players, will have like a sticker for a touchdown or a sack or whatever. Oh, the case right. Might. Yeah. That's another. Every, every arpeggio you learn. Oh, yes. Every, every blues box, every scale. Right. Right. 
have each a little <laughs> it's like the boy scouts a little patch for every little sticker for every one i just earned my major scale patch <laughs> <laughs> just stick them to your guitar strap this is my sash right? this is my sash oh uh, boy we have guitars walking around selling cookies that will be just kind of weird um, <laughs> so. alright so we, we, we had to bring that up because it was entertaining to uh, Jesse and I and let's face it most of the show is just entertaining Jesse and me so uh, <laughs> and can, but boy are we entertained that's right right our broad listening base must agree. All right. So anyway, tonight's topic, the main topic for tonight that we wanted to talk about uh, are pedals. So we've talked about, you know, guitars, how to buy a guitar. We talked about how to buy an amp. Um, we've done some theory stuff. And we thought, that, you know, let's get back to some gear kinds of related things. And so we thought we'd talk a little bit about pedals and what pedals are, what they can do, what are the different types of pedals. And so if you're interested in the effects thing, uh, how do you get started? Right. And if you uh, thumb through any of the catalogs or guitar uh, rags, boy, you'll see a lot of pedals. Oh, <laughs> Every boy. configuration known to man. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, yeah, little history. I guess pedals pretty much started um, trying to emulate other effects, other things. And, uh, and they figured that they could do them electronically instead of... Um, however they affect happened the first time. And so there's sort of different classes of pedals. Um, and I'll put these in the show notes. But um, so, uh, well, the first thing that is the configuration. So you could have individual effects. So you could go out and buy a overdrive pedal or a distortion pedal or an echo delay pedal or a multi-effect unit, like a floor unit. Um, and actually, I can see in your background, you have a couple of single effect pedals. Oh, back. <laughs> yeah, I got my uh, Boss, uh, I think it's a DS1. Yes, the Bold yeah. Orange Distortion. Yeah, and then I got one by Digitech uh, called Screamin' Blues, um, which is a pretty cool pedal, too. There are probably more kinds of distortion pedals than like anything in the world. Probably, yeah. Yeah. Uh, or you could get a, uh, a floor unit that it incorporates uh, several of them. And not so big these days, but boy, in the 80s, there was a lot of rack mount gear um, where you'd have maybe a floor pedal thing that would control the rack mount and then it would just be a rack box. Wow. Uh, yeah, in a day they had like racks, you know. Of course, you had to put something on top of your Marshall stack. So. Right. They have, they have the effects. <laughs> so those are kind of the form factors. Um but then there's the type of, of effect that it actually does. Um, and maybe we should go through these sort of in a signal chain sort of way. So um, you'll start with your guitar and then a cable. And sometimes you just go into an amplifier. And that is an effect of itself because it modifies the sound. So in an amplifier, sure. you'll have equalization, you know, your bass, mid, and treble, maybe presence, knobs. You'll have maybe a reverb, you know, which is makes it sound like you're in a hall, but that's an artificial effect, even if it's just like a spring in the amplifier. Right. Um, then you'll have um, so usually some kind of gain or distortion or overdrive in the amp. Yep. Um, so the, that started out as, amps didn't used to have that, of course. It used to be you just, you want distortion, you crank the amp up all the way until the speaker was bleeding. <laughs> and it sounded nice and fuzzy and people liked that. So they figured out how to make an amp do that without being loud because they then they had different stages. So you could overdrive one stage, but not the volume part. Um, and that's where we get the overdrive term because that's really what's going on. So um, then they figured out, well, if we can do that in the amp, we can add, add that to a little box and just have a little distortion circuit in there that will sound like an overdriven amplifier and give you the bleeding speaker sound, but without the volume. And I think those are about the first effect pedals where that overdrives. Would, and... Yeah, that would make sense to me. It's like the, the, what's the sound that you want to just, you know, first produce before you start messing around with things. What's the first thing you want to produce? And I think you brought up a good point that I don't want to um, pass over. If you're new to this stuff, uh, don't underestimate the effects you can get from your amp by itself. Even Absolutely. if you don't have a modeling amp, even if you have a basic solid state amp with bass, mid, treble, gain, and maybe some reverb. All right. All right. Like my Fender Frontman. Um, that's basically the controls you have on that. And you can get quite a few different effects, different sounds out of your guitar by just messing around with those dials. 
Right. Uh, so, you know, experiment there first before you get too crazy with the, the pedal collection. Right. Because the sound so, you're after may actually be already in your amp. Oh, absolutely. Um, another thing that's sort of related is compression, which mm -hmm. um, one of the effects that when you crank up an amp all the way and you have distorted tubes, because the earliest guitar amps were tube amplifiers because back in the 50s that's what they had <laughs> so right. it really wasn't around yet nice. um one of the effects that it has is to compress the signal and what that means is when you play a, a note or a chord you'll notice that as you hit it at the beginning it, it's very loud and then it tails off and gets softer and softer until it dies away and so what a compressor does and what tubes actually do and distortion does as well is it kind of saws off that first waveform and flattens it out so it's not as loud as it otherwise would be. And so the difference between the loud and the soft bit of that note or chord are, are smaller. So it kind of evens everything out, which is why when you're playing one of those singing solos, you can do that and it just sustains right? because everything is smoothed out. And now you can do it with distortion, but you can also do it with a, a different device called a compressor, which uh, gives you a very clean effect. It takes off that, that peak um, without distorting it. A lot of people like the smoothness of putting a compressor before the distortion. Or if you have a, a guitar amp, you can have a compressor into the amplifier. Um, different kind of distortion. It gives you a lot of sustain and um, it's a really nice sound if you're looking for a good solo sound. Uh, country players, of course, use it without the distortion. <laughs> you right. Know, that really right. clean twang, but also with some sustain. So that's what a compressor does. Um, and those are basically the amp sort of effects you know, that you could get with an amp. Then um, we have all the fancy stuff. <laughs> so we have, uh, and most of them are time-based effects. So you have the reverb that we discussed a little bit. It makes it sound like you're in a hall or a big room. But there's also echo, and there's a lot of different kinds of echo. Uh, that basically sounds like it kind of gives you an ambient sound as well, but it's a more defined, instead of just a wash of kind of, reverb you get a defined echo so you play a note and you hear a note coming back at you and you can set how far those repeats are how how long it repeats the 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 time factor between the repeats all that there's all kinds of parameters ping pong between two different speakers or there's all kinds of stuff um so that's the the, the easiest time-based effect then there's uh there's chorus we should probably play some of these. We should. So why don't I think we, we do should. That? Yeah. So let's uh, say what we're going to play through so that uh, people are aware. I have, and I don't know if I can, I'm going to try to lift it up so I, um, so folks can see it. Uh, we should get better cameras or something. Um, <laughs> Secondary cameras. Yeah. I don't know. This is probably somewhat visible to you. This is a Boss ME70. It's one of those multi-effects pedals uh, that... Very convenient because you have a bunch of stuff right here. I think I paid about $270 for this and lots of different, not only effects, but also um, uh, amp models. Mm -hmm. And so that's pretty cool where, you know, you have a combo, clean, tweed, stack, lead stack, uh, a couple others. And then what's nice about the boss one, I think, more than anything else, is that there's no menu system. It's just dials. And if you're learning about these things, there's this nice easy tone button that you can press and the easy tone sort of does what they think is the nicest sound for that effect. And of course, your, mm -hmm. your opinion will be different, but what it's, what it's good for is to get a sense of what is that effect? If you're new yeah. to this stuff, you know, what does it sound like? Good without starting having, place. Yeah, it's a great starting place. All right. And I'm going to play through my Fender Frontman 25 or with my Les Paul Studio Satin. So uh, lovely. Guitar. Those. Yes, thank you. For those that are wanting to know at home what we're playing. How about you, Jesse? So I'm playing through a uh, PV Nano Viper, which is a tiny modeling amplifier. Um, can be battery powered if you want, which is really cool. And I have my Parker Dragonfly 524, which is baby number two. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I should <laughs> show. Not... Yes. Yeah, awesome. And this, this is the Space Bunny guitar, in case you can't see the Space Bunny. Oh, cool. Yeah, yes. yeah. Excellent. All right, so uh, what effect should we try first? Do you want to try... Um, how about just the distortion? So... Sure. I'll turn that on. I'll use the easy tone setting. So just a clean guitar sound. 
I've just got a nice standard clean amplifier that isn't distorting at all. Right. So if you want to uh, elucidate upon the distortion oh, sure. sound. So uh, we'll, we'll do a power chord because we're distorted, right? Of I'll course. Play a G power chord. And so you can hear on that heavy distortion, right? Very so, different sound. <laughs> yeah, very different sound. Just kind of messing around with a few power chords. Um, anyhow, that is your distortion. I'm going to turn my effects off so that when you talk, it's not uh, <laughs> overpowering. <laughs> Over time, that one's a, a pretty dominating sound there. <laughs> That's awesome. That's the thing. Well, some distortion actually can be sort of subtle. Um, yes. Like you don't have to go balls out, as it were. Um, right. There are some distortions that are sort of um, more just bluesy players often like just a little bit of hair i guess on the sound yeah. it's just a slight amount of distortion you know it's not really overpowering but right. it still gives you that sustain and the compression and a little bit more you know grit i guess sure a little bit more towards the overdrive uh is this model it's sort of i think it's supposed to be like the blues driver pedal mm -hmm. so that kind yeah. of thing yeah much more a little bit like what you were playing but it's a bit more subtle and just sort of a bit more like more overdrive necessarily than distortion in a sense right so those are some basics of uh, overdrive and really overdrive and distortion are sort of the same thing um but usually when you hear overdrive it's um trying to emulate a distorted amp and so usually they'll, they'll talk about it with a little bit less kind of fuzz distortion pretty much means yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. raging like, stack sort of thing. I say like fuzz, core, metal. <laughs> it's like the names yeah. of the distortions that I have on the pedal here. Like you can just have they're aggressive sounds, and right. uh, and they have a particular sort of genre they're shooting for, and it's not country. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so moving on to <laughs> delay based effects. Uh, let's go for just a basic delay. Yeah, so that's just a um, a basic. Uh, repeat. That's a really long repeat. Um, it gives you a little ambience, and what's nice about that is if you crank up the level on it, you can actually play along with yourself. Like Brian May did a lot of that before there were harmonizers. Like he right. would play bits of a solo, and then as that would play back, he would play a harmony over top of it. And so he could sort of stack guitars up live. Um, now cool. people tend to do that in like one man shows or smaller bands where they'll build a sound and they'll loop it. And a looper is sort of a specialized delay where you record, say, eight seconds of a phrase or something and then play that back as you play the next bit, play them back and sort of do this live multi-tracking, which is cool. Oh, and it's great for practice, too. So oh, if yeah. you want to sort of create your own jam track. Like my multi effects pedal, I think does 38 seconds and mm -hmm. you can record over, t you can layer it. And so uh, if you want to do like a little blues and A, pop out, you know, throw that out real quick, loop it, and then you can just play over top of that as if you have a, a little jam track with you, which is nice. Yeah. Uh, how about another delay uh, or time based one? I've got a reverse setting. Oh, sweet. Hey, make sure that I have it actually set. The angle at which mine is, is kind of hard to read. So here's a reverse. I don't know. Did that come through? Yeah, it does. That's cool. Yeah. So that's a, that's a weird one to uh, to play along with for sure. Yeah, because it messes up your uh, kind of the timing. It's a little yep. unexpected. Yeah, so I know. That, I felt it's weird. The way they uh, they came up with that was they used to. Hendrix was one of the early ones. I don't know if he was the first. Maybe it might have been the Beatles the first. But um, so they would take reverb, you know, and back in the day, of course, there were no digital effects. So right. they would um, they had a reverb tank, which was sort of a really big, high quality spring reverb that you might see in a classic guitar amp, except it was you build them into a wall of a studio because they were huge, but they were very high quality. But what they would do is record that reverb onto a tape, flip the tape over, play it backwards, and then they'd, ha they'd play that into the song. Oh, crazy. That's wow. how they had to do it. It was a lot of work. Wow. 
wow, now we just turn on the effect or if you're on your computer, your sampler, you just reverse it. <laughs> cool. Uh, we talked about compression too. Um, we can Compression's go... a little harder to hear. I'm not sure if that's going to come across the microphones, but we could try. Okay, you... let me try it. I don't know if that came through or not very well. What you can hear is if you turn off the compressor, then you can hear the attacks on the, each note. I think that's what I played. Yeah. And then when the compressor's on, it just smooths out that sound. Yeah. With a clean sound, it's it's really hard to hear the effect of a compressor unless you're listening for it. Yeah. It's pretty transparent. Uh, let's see. Well... I have so, some things like a defretter and slow gear <laughs> and single uh, uh, to humbucker and hum to single and oh my. It's all kinds of crazy effects. But I think it's probably better to maybe move so, on to some modulation stuff. Yeah. So um, modulation is uh, these are also time based effects. Probably the, the most popular one is chorus. And the idea is to make it sound like there's more than one guitar there. Uh, mm -hmm. So what they do is they delay the sound just a little bit, maybe 30 milliseconds or so. And um, they mix that sound back in with the original, but also use an oscillator to detune it a little bit so that not only is the timing a little off from the original, but also the pitch. Shouldn't be enough that you can hear that it's out of tune, but when you play it together, it sounds like there's a couple of guitars playing. Yeah. You know? Nice. And we get used to that. Now we just know it as a chorus sound. It doesn't really sound like two guitars, but it has that full sweeping sort of effect. You know? Right. Very nice. Very nice. Um, another one that's fairly popular is a flanger. And mm -hmm. it's my understanding that that was actually done with tape uh, yes. while they were when it was first done. I think uh, Tony Iommi and some of those folks were probably some of the early pioneers of the flanger. Uh and then again, you know, please, listeners, if I'm wrong, don't hesitate to correct me. Uh, well, I think it's about that time. I think the Beatles on Revolver had the, the earliest right, the first. that I know about. Yeah. Uh, there might be others. It's Everybody was experimenting back then. So, so Flanger is something I have very uh, little uh, experience with. So maybe what I'll do is just play through a G chord uh, mm -hmm. and see how that sounds. As a... That doesn't – it's not coming through very good, is it? No. Uh, let me try – C chord. Is that coming through? That came through. Yeah. So you can sort of hear that effect of the flanger effect, which is kind of a neat effect. It is. It's really similar to a chorus. In fact, <laughs> um, that's why you'll get like chorus slash flanger pedals, you know, that'll do both. Oh, yeah. yeah. And with any flanger a pedal, you should be able to get a passable chorus effect. Uh, flanger, the, that delay is just shorter, maybe like 10 or so milliseconds. And then they, um, it's not just one repeat. They actually feed it back and it regenerates. So you get that sweep. Yep. And as it sweeps, it changes the, you know, it has these interference patterns. So it cuts some frequencies and boosts others. So you get that jet sounding effect. Right, right. Yeah. And you're right about the tape. The, do you know why it was called flanging? No, no. Yeah. So like on an open reel tape in the studio... The, the on the spool the the part that holds the tape is called a flange and they would uh send the signal to two different tape machines and one of them they would kind of press their thumb on the flange and it would delay it in relation to the other one and so you had this sweepy sound oh so clever back then and, well it yeah. was either that or the drugs one or the other yeah that's true <laughs> <laughs> hey man, let's try this special okay. brownies for the studio <laughs> that's right that's right <laughs> studio brownies uh, let's see. What's another, maybe one more modulation we should talk about? Phaser or uh, what do you think is a popular one? Phaser's, I don't know how popular Phaser is nowadays, but I mean, that's okay. one of them. So um, Phaser is similar to a flanger, but they do it a different way. It's um, instead of a time delay, it has a like a phase shifting um not algorithm, phase shifting kind of setup. And then it also regenerates back into itself. And you get a similar kind of effect. Um, it's a little more, I don't want to say dated, but it, it definitely sounds more 60s and 70s yeah. because it was yeah, popular definitely. then. Flange kind of, it's still out there, you know? Yeah. 
So, so what do you think as a modulation then might be the more popular? So chorus and what's the other one? Flange is big for for um, especially like metal and stuff. I mean, we get yeah. that Van Halen sweep like the beginning of Unchained or something. <laughs> um, but yeah, those two are the biggest chorus. Everybody, if you have a clean sound, it almost always have some kind of chorus on it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Cool. All right. Well, um, just to tell you what, just as one other thing to show, um, the modeling effects on the uh, ME70 is probably interesting to point out. Let me go to a clean sound. That should be coming through. So... So that's what's sort of labeled as clean on the effect. Mm -hmm. If we do a, um, a stack, let's see here. Give me one second. Well, <laughs> These are out. they're they're meant to be used <laughs> from above. So this whole like on the tray <laughs> thing is. Uh... So there's a stack uh, modulation, which isn't too bad. Mm -hmm. Not too bad, you know. No. Does a pretty good job with different things. It's it's not perfect, but it's not not terrible either. Um, that's it's a lot of fun to play with. So oh, yeah. yeah. So um, <laughs> we don't have a whole lot of time left. However, uh, how do you recommend people getting into effects? Like they, they they might have listened to what we did and said, hey, you know what? I want my guitar to make those noises. Uh, what's a good way you think of getting into these kind of thing? Well, probably the easiest way is um, if there's a noise that you know you like, whether it's an album or a certain guitar player or a certain song, um, I would Google it. <laughs> we always recommend the Google machine. Absolutely. And then uh, and, and somewhere out there, you know, say, uh, I don't know, Eddie Van Halen Unchained, you know, beginning effect or something like that. And you'll find out pretty quickly people out there will post how he got that. You know, say, well, yes, you need a big stack amplifier or something that sounds like it, some kind of modeler or whatever. Um, and then he used a flanger and he used an echo. And the, if you, you'll probably get one that says, with this many milliseconds of delay, this many repeats, and you know. <laughs> right, right. Um, and so that's probably, if you're going for a specific sound, that's a good way to do it. Um, if you're just kind of getting an idea of what's out there and what you want to do, I would go to the closest music store and, um, and try like a multi effects kind of pedal like what you have. Um, those are really um, convenient because everything's there and it'll have the, the most popular things you can play with and get a rough idea of the different sounds. Um, you like the phaser in your machine may not sound just like an electro harmonic small stone phaser that right. Hendrix used, but it'll get you sort of in the ballpark so you can know whether that's a sound you like. And, um, and, and even I would say these things aren't that expensive. So when you're first starting out, it, it's a good buy to go ahead and just get something like that. And then as you get better and decide, you know, just like a guitar, you know, you, you become a finer aficionado of what you actually like. Right. Same with effects. I mean, you can say, well, you know what? I, I like this effect better. And then you can go buy a, a one shot phaser or a flanger yeah. or whatever it might be. Yeah. Um, so... I think that's probably a good way to go about it. I, I think you're absolutely right. I think uh, you'll get some folks that will say, oh, well, these multi-effects pedals aren't true effects. They don't have the greatest sound quality or whatnot. Uh, yeah, that might be true, but it does give you a chance to sort of shop around, right? True. And like you said, dial in. I would recommend, you know, if you're just starting with guitar, give yourself <clears throat> six months at least to learn how to play guitar. Oh, yeah. Right. You know, yeah. learn learn how to play first, then move into the effects and, and look at it as something to look forward to. You know, I'm getting this stuff down so that I can experiment with the effects later and then, you know, start to sample. And I think the multi effects pedal is a great platform for that. And I at some point plan on moving into um, getting a pedal board and getting into pedals that I you know find that I really want. I think before I do that, though, I, I would rather get maybe a tube amp. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think I would want to do that. Um, now the reason, I guess, because, uh, and maybe it's just my own pigheadishness, but I think, you know, a nice tube amp, you know, it's sort of like a lot of the old guys, that's what they played, right? Cause they didn't have a choice. Sure. And then, you know, you can work building up your sound there. Whereas I don't know, 
if I would get a high quality sound with nice pedals and the sort of the inexpensive solid state amps that I have. Right. Another option too, by the way, that I would recommend, and this is uh, really the route that I took. Um, quite frankly, I had a modeling amp first, mm-hmm. and you can get something like a Fender Mustang One, very inexpensively, about a hundred bucks. It has all those effects built in. It's got the software. You can pair up. You can hook up the the um, the amp via USB. And uh, I'm sure other brands have this too. It's probably not just Fender, but this is the one that I have. Is why I'm talking about this particular one. And that will let you experiment. It's not quite though as convenient as having the multi effects pedal. Yeah, because you have to have uh, some. Kind so you of have to have the computer there. Yeah, you there. Have, there's quite a bit you can do with the knobs and buttons on the actual amp. Mm-hmm. Right. There's quite a bit there. But again, I just find it to be a lot more convenient to hook up my multi effects pedal and then I'm off and running because everything's labeled with buttons and knobs and just turn things and you're you're good to go. Um, That's true. But it's, you know, you if, know go ahead. I'm sorry. If the budget's a constraint for you, then the modeling amp, that's the way to go. Oh, yeah. And there's no, I mean, honestly, most of the time I don't play through an amp. I, I think I've said this before. Where, like I have a yeah. modeler that goes through my little stereo system. So um, – and that's certainly a valid thing. And there are stuff – I mean, go to the store. Just look and see. And there's – you know, everybody has their favorite sort of brand, whether it's, you know, Line 6 or Boss, uh, Roland, Digitech. I mean, they're so competitive. Um yep. That you can go and spend a hundred bucks and pretty much cover in a number of ways, whether it be a small modeling amp or a headphone based, um, you know, multi effect pedal or modeling system, whatever you want, um, and get the basics of all that stuff. And as you say, spend a few months really working through these sounds, talking to other guitar players. Yep. Bugging the guys at the music store. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> you know? Jump and, on uh, YouTube. I mean, everyone absolutely. has got reviews of these things. If you want to know what this particular pedal sounds like, just search on YouTube. And, absolutely. you know, it's not the greatest sound because of the compression and whatnot, but it gives you a taste. And oh, then yeah. you can sort of know, hey, do I want to get serious about this and pursue this further or not? So. And don't get too hung up, I'd say too, don't get too hung up on like when people say this is awesome and this is crap because you'll have different people yeah. that will – and they, everybody has a different opinion about what is awesome and what is crap. Yep. And the fact is everything is so competitive now that I don't think anything is head and shoulders above anything else. I mean the modeler that I use typically, this thing came out in 2001. <laughs> I mean it's ancient. Nobody would – say that's the best of anything but i'll tell you what i like the noises i make so hey i've played with you when you've been playing through that it sounds great i mean it's amazing it's from 2001 it's still moving and going like a champ things like what 14 years old or almost 14 years old now uh and uh that's that's saying something you can get quality stuff that's going to last and you don't have to pay an arm and a leg for it which is a great thing the main thing is don't lose sight of the fact that we're trying to make music Yes. So we, we yes. tend to get focused on the tools and, you know, nobody right. who builds houses gets hung up on his Makita model screwdriver. Right. Right. <laughs> he builds that. That's house. right. <laughs> yep. If you want to be a fanboy about something, then have at it. But don't forget, like you said, ultimately, we're trying to make music here. All right. Well, I think that will uh, wrap us up for uh, this evening. Uh, unless you have anything else you'd like to add, Jesse? That's good. Rock good. on, people. All right. Well, remember, boys and girls, until next time, just keep picking and grinning. Good night. Six Strings and Things, a guitar adventure, is a production of Jester Cat Studios. You can see more about this and all other Jester Cat shows at JesterCat.com. You can also email the show at SST at JesterCat.com or continue the conversation on Twitter at SST Show. You can follow Robert at RS Macy, Jesse at Jester 700, and Chris at CW Culp. Thanks to Jesse for playing and recording our intro music. 